Amen, amen. God bless you. Shake hands with somebody if you want, and you may be seated. We are continuing on with this series of teachings uh, concerning relationships, love, marriage, all of those kinds of things. And tonight we're going to talk about the five love languages. You're going to learn how to speak in tongues in the five love languages. But before we start, we're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and uh, verse 4 to 8. And uh, if we could get that on the screen, Charlie. All right. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. And so we want to continue on with uh, this teaching, but tonight we're deviating from the Song of Solomon, and uh, we're going to deal specifically with this subject here tonight. And uh, let me just start out by talking about love here a little bit. How many people think they know a little bit about love? Uh, seven of you. We're really, we're really on a, an important subject, I think, tonight. Now, if love is the center of human relationships, what is love? What is love? What is love? Now, some children were asked what love is and how people fall in love, and one kid said, nobody knows, it just happens. Another kid said it's something about the way people smell, and that's why perfume and deodorant are so popular. And another kid, Gary, age seven, said, uh, it's not always about how you look, because he said, I'm real handsome, and I'm not married yet. But let me ask you, just, you know, for a little crowd participation, what is love. Now, when I ask this, it's always dangerous because someone may want to give a really long speech. So you have to make it really short, like a sentence. But uh, when I say, what is love? How, what, how would you describe what love is? Anybody? Just putting others before yourself? Okay. Anybody else? Unconditional? Okay, now, what, what is love, though? What, we know that love should be unconditional, but what is that thing called love? What is that? What does it feel like? Or what is it like? I guess unconditional would be what it's like. You're right. But what is love? What would you say love is? Anybody else? Affection, a deep abiding affection, okay. Anybody else? A need, kind of like eating. Anybody else? What is love? I'm, I think everybody's right, really. Respect, yeah. When someone really cares about you? Yeah. Let me ask you another question. What makes a person fall in love with someone? And I'm talking about, you know, not the kind of love you have for your kids or the kind of love you have for your parents, but the kind of love that people have when they marry one another. What, what makes that happen? 
You've heard people say, love at first sight. Soon as I saw her across the room, I loved her. I knew I was going to marry that woman. I fell in love with her the first time I talked to her. The first time we went out to dinner, I fell in love with her. Uh, how, what makes people fall in love? Art? A spark that grows into a fire, waxing eloquent. Say that again. I still can't hear because of the cooking skills. Let me come over, you make me dinner, and then we'll see if this thing goes on any farther. An attraction for one another. Anybody else? How do people fall in love? What makes people fall in love? How fast can people fall in love? <laughs> can it happen fast? Love at first sight? Have you ever looked at people and said, what does she ever see in him? <laughs> um, we know that falling in love is not just infatuation. Now, how many people don't know what the word infatuation means? Okay, everybody does. That's awesome. Okay, we're going to pass the mic around and get the definition. <laughs> no, just joking. But infatuation is that physical attraction, that craving, that desire that you feel. And it's usually sometimes where the feeling begins of love. But infatuation is the, is the feeling of attraction that's combined with Appearance and chemistry and imagination. What happens is when people begin to feel attraction, sometimes there's some appearance, there's some physical and even, uh, even personality connection, what we may call chemistry, that difficult thing to define. But you know when people get married... And they, and, and they think they love one another. If it begins but never goes any farther than infatuation, that wears pretty thin after a while. Infatuation and, and, the, and, the, uh, and the, the excitement about being with one another and so on, that wears kind of thin because love is actually something that is far deeper and it is not something that, that can exist suddenly. It's not, people actually do not fall in love. Brother Dummett used to say, people fall in ditches. But you don't actually fall in love, although it feels like that, because that excitement and that chemistry creates that spark, as Art said earlier, that gets a little fire going. It's, it's what pushes the relationship forward. But then for love, real love, the kind of love that lasts to exist, there has to be some cultivating and there has to be some work and there has to be some time invested for love to grow. Amen. Um, people get married, uh, who get married on infatuation soon find out that it's a veneer, that it's not real love and it won't last. But there's a different kind of love Real love, the lasting love, is something that is deliberate. It's something that is cultivated, as I mentioned. The word love is actually more of a verb than it is uh, an emotion. It's more of an action. It's more something that you do and something that you show than it is something that you feel. Amen. Too many people are getting their cues about love from movies and from television. Or a fairy tale book. 
I mean, there's lots of really awesome fairy tales. You know, little girls love those fairy tales. Uh, the, the, you know, the uh, Cinderella and uh, all of the, uh, all of those uh, fairy tales that center around uh, what is that? Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And the and the the prince always comes along, and there's the the special kiss or whatever. And, and you know, it's surprising. How many people actually think that romance and love and relationships are supposed to be like what they see on the television or in a movie or what they read of in some romance book? Lo and behold, guess what? Nobody lives like that. Life isn't like that. That's not real, it's a fairy tale. It's imagination. It's designed to give you an escape from the real world. But guess what? The real world is not a Cinderella story, nor is it a Harlequin romance. I've never read one of them, but I hear they're popular to some people. But lifelong love is cultivated and it's nurtured. It's something that you give, not just something that you receive. Amen. It deepens over time, not weakens over time. Now, Gary uh, Chapman, I hope I got his name correct. First name is Gary for sure. (laughs) He wrote a book called The Five Love Languages. And in that book, how many people have ever heard of The Five Love Languages? Okay, how many people have never heard? Okay, most of you. Well, in in that book, he talks about uh, cultivating and nurturing love requires learning your partner's love language. Just like people can come from different cultures, which causes them to react differently in different circumstances. Uh, Let me give you an example. Sometimes working for certain cultures where they are direct, and when they want to correct their employees, they speak directly, you know, they just let you have it. For, for a person who is not accustomed to that culture, they find that very offensive. And so they have difficulty. But when you know the culture, and you're a part of that culture, you don't maybe take that as being offensive. Well, the, the, the same is true in a love language. People are as different in expressing and understanding love as people are about culture. Amen. Uh, People feel love and they show love differently. Uh, If you don't speak their language, then they may not be getting the message. If you're married or you're in a relationship, you might be showing love this way, but they actually hear love this way. And so you're thinking, why do they not think I love them? Why do they always think that I'm, I'm not interested in them? And the truth is, you're probably not speaking their language. They haven't learned your language, and you haven't learned theirs, and therefore there's a communication problem. You might say, well, if they can't tell that I love them, then they've got a problem. Obviously, I'm showing them. No, what you're doing is you're speaking your love language which may be different than theirs. Uh, What if they feel love in a different way than you show it? People usually show love the way they they feel love. They show love from their love language as opposed to understanding their, their spouse's love language and trying to express love in a way that they can interpret. Let me, uh, let, uh, 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 let me see if I can give you an example. Uh, I'll give that, this example in a few seconds. Uh, the problem with, uh, often is that people marry those who are opposites. Those that are married here today, how many people think that you married someone who's actually like an opposite of you? Huh? That's what they say. How many people think that my wife and I are like opposites? <laughs> really? Well, the thing is, we're, because often we marry opposites, the love language of our spouse is not the same as ours. So you're talking love and they're talking love, but you don't understand one another very clearly. Now, 
over years, you know, 32 years, we've been married, my wife and I, in uh, next Thursday. You get to learn a lot about one another, but let me tell you the first five or six years, <laughs> you've ever heard of the school of hard knocks. And so uh, learning one another's love language is important. Okay, there's five different love languages, and if you're taking notes and you can count the five, you can write these down. Number one type of love language, and we'll explain each one of these uh, differently in, uh, uh, in, a, in a moment. And by the way, I'm going to hand out a little quiz, and before we're done here, you're going to write down your love language. You're going to go through this quiz, and then if your partner is here with you or they're at home, I want you to take, take it home to them. And if they're not here with you, have them do the quiz and share with each other so you can see what each other's love language is. You will not be telling us here tonight, okay? The reason I'm saying that is because a couple of these, you may raise your eyebrows. Number one, your love language might be loving or affirming words. Number two, your love language might be kind actions. Number three, your love language might be quality time. Number four, your love language might be thoughtful gifts or presents. Some of you are saying, I speak all four of those thus far. And for some of you, it might be physical affection or touch. Okay. Now, what if your love language is loving and affirming words, and you're saying, I love you to your partner a lot. You're, you're telling them, I love you, I love you. But her love language or his love language is quality time. So you keep telling them that you love them, but you know you're busy and you don't spend uh, very much focused time on them. And so despite what you say, she or he is not feeling loved, because their love language is quality time. And that's what they hear. That's what they feel. That's what's important to them. Or let's say, for instance, that, uh, uh, you know, you, you do all this care for the family and you work and you support and, and, uh, and you're doing all of these things for your home. But, but his or her love language is affirming words. And so you say, what do you mean I never say that I love you. What do you, what do you mean I never, I never let you know that I love you? Look at all that I'm doing. I'm working. I'm supporting the family. I'm, you know, I'm bringing home the bread and the butter. Of course I love you. But you see, that doesn't communicate to that person love to the same degree as affirming words. So even though you're doing all of those things, they're hearing it differently. Am I making sense yet? Now, let's get into the nitty-gritty. So you can see how the problem begins. It's not that you don't love each other. It's that you're speaking different languages. You have to learn your partner's love language so you can show them love in a way that they can understand. Some of us have grown up in homes where some of these languages were not spoken. For instance, maybe you grew up in a home where there was very little physical affection. There were no hugs or none to speak of. There, there was not much as far as physical touch. And so you married a person now that that's their love language. They need physical touch or they need that kind of, uh, that kind of connection, that kind of, that kind of physical contact. But you grew up in a home where that's not expressed. And, and therefore, you're not that kind of a person. Well, you can do one of two things. You can say, well, you know what? I'm just not that kind of a person, so they're just going to have to deal with it. Or you can be a grown-up Christian, and you can say, this is the love language of my spouse, and I need to learn how to be more physically affectionate because that's what they need. I just felt like it got really quiet here all of a sudden. Did anybody else feel that? Was that just me? It was like everybody, all the air just got sucked out of the room. Or perhaps you grew up in a family where words were not expressed, where 
believe it or not, sometimes people grow up in a home where, where they never hear their parents say, I love you. I grew up in a home like that. I, grew, I cannot in my whole life remember my father ever saying to me that he loved me. Anybody else grew up in a home like that? Lots of us. You know, sometimes that generation was like that, right? And so, now, I don't have any problem expressing that because probably that's in my wheelhouse, but sometimes when people grow up in that environment, they, they don't know how to express that. That's not their love language. That's not how they've been trained. That's not their personality. But they're with somebody that, that that's important to them. And so maybe your love language is gifts. So you're bringing home gifts every week. Oh, I got you flowers. Here's some chocolates. Here's a trip to Bahamas. Now I think anybody could get used to that. <laughs> but really, they're not looking for another gift. They're looking for words. And so they begin to think, what are you trying to buy, my love? They start turning it around. It actually becomes a negative, and you have a fight over you're trying to express your love, but they're hearing it a different way. Do you see how things happen? Anybody relating to me yet? Okay, so let's talk about loving words for a minute. Here's my second scripture of the night. Proverbs 16, verse 24. It says, pleasant words are like honeycomb, sweetness to the soul, and health to the bones. So what is sweetness to the soul and health to the bones? Pleasant words. Now, how many people know that there are, there's power in the tongue? There's power in the tongue to heal, and there's power in the tongue to hurt. Some people are more hurt by words than others, and they're also more helped by words than others. Now, all of us, no matter if this is our love language or not, need to learn how to speak in a way to other people that actually builds them up and not tears them down. So, you know, just because uh, affirming or loving words are not your love language doesn't mean, well, you can go around tearing people down and criticizing. No, we're still Christians, right? But... I think it's important that we know whether or not our partner's love language is loving words. Now, aside from that, none of us should ever publicly make fun, demean, slander our partner. We should never, ever give any indication while we're out to dinner with people or while the family's over or while anything is going on that somehow, at that very moment in time, you're not thinking too much of her or him. You should keep that to yourself, first of all. Nor should you ever criticize or throw your partner, as we say, under the bus to other people. That's crazy. That tears down, that destroys. But for some people, the use of words is even more important than just everyone because their love language is strongly expressed in words. Amen. What are ways we can use words to speak the love language of our partner if that is their love language, loving words? Well, just some very basic things. You can pay some compliments. What are some compliments, man, that you could give to your wives? Say that again. That's a lovely meal that you made. They always say the way to a man's heart is through his mouth, through his stomach. All right. You look beautiful. Well, he's practiced that. That was almost... And so, basically, you can use compliments. If, if, and the same is true if the man is, uh, his love language is loving words. He wants to hear 
compliments. He wants to hear words that build him up. He, you might say, well, he's just a baby. He just wants me to stroke his ego. No. You got to understand that men and women can have this same love language. Obviously, the compliments would be different. I don't know if I would take it as a compliment. My wife said, you absolutely look, absolutely look pretty today. Now, obviously, we have to be genuine, and it can't be just fake. Something else you could do is say thanks. You know, to someone whose love language is loving words, actually telling them thank you, showing them verbally, verbally giving them appreciation for what they have done, that, that sends strong messages. That's a strong message message to them. It, it, it causes them to feel value and to feel worth. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for cooking that meal. I have that in my notes. Thank you for working hard for our family. Thank you for filling up my car. Thank you for picking up those things at the grocery store on the way home. Thank you for vacuuming or whatever it is that you might do, you can convey that. And to someone who responds to loving words, paying compliments are important. Saying thanks, being encouraging, lifting up, giving encouragement instead of criticizing. Constant criticism robs our partner of their spirit of worth. If somebody's love language, now you got to get this. If somebody's love language is loving words, and you are... That sucks the wind right out of them. Now, everybody might feel that way if that's the way it was, but they react differently to words than maybe you, okay? I got to hurry because I got a really funny video I hope to play at the end of this. Uh, being thoughtful. Uh, another way of, uh, of uh, uh, conveying your message in words is sending a note. Putting a note in someone's purse or their wallet or leaving a note taped somewhere, some note that says something about them or that some note that conveys to them your feelings or your admiration or your love or whatever. You're, you're conveying that verbally even through writing. Also how you make requests. You know, we always ask one another for stuff, you know, Sometimes I need a shirt ironed. I'm busy throughout the day, and, and I maybe didn't uh, have a, an ironed shirt when I, when I came to, to church. And, and I might say to my wife, dear, could you, could you please iron me a shirt and bring it with you when you come? And uh, how we make those requests, how we convey those requests, or whatever they are, they have a tremendous amount of meaning to someone who, who, where words are very important. That's their love language. So when you're just kind of, get me that. You know, you're, you're abrupt and you're harsh and you're, and you're, you know, you're demanding. Can I tell you this? I never demand anything from my wife, ever. I never say, you do this. I've never, in 32 years, I've, have I ever done that? I have never treated her like somehow she was a piece of property of mine. If she said, well, I, I don't really want to do it, okay. I don't demand, I request. And I try to do it politely. I'm sure there are times I've deviated from that slightly, but, but you know what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, okay, so that's, that's the love language of loving words. What's the second love language? Did you write them down? Kind actions. For some people, kind actions speak louder than words. So you may be saying all kinds of things to them. I love you, babe, and you know, you're the only one for me, and boy, you look tremendous, and all those kinds of things. You may be verbalizing all of those things because that's how you understand love, but maybe theirs is kind actions. For some people, kind actions speak louder than words. 
And so if her love language or his love language is kind actions, they almost have to be random and unplanned, like on a Saturday morning, you get up and bring her coffee or him coffee while he's still in bed. And he's, maybe he'll say, you're just trying to burn me. Uh, <laughs> or maybe you cook someone's favorite meal or you do, you do something or, or you make reservations uh, for dinner or you drop by their workplace and, and you bring them something there. Or, you know, all kinds of possibilities, ways that you could show uh, kind actions. Doing a chore that usually is done by the other person. They usually, maybe, they usually do the dishes, but you say, why don't you just relax and put your feet up? I'll do the dishes. Whatever, whatever the case may be, whatever that is. Um, maybe your, your spouse is under some pressure and some load because of their work schedule or whatever, and you relieve them of some of the things that they do. You tell them to relax, and you go and do the work. To a person whose love language is acts of kindness, that is way, way, way louder than anything you could ever say. That is so powerful in their minds that it, what you're saying to them is, this is how much I love you. And that's how it resonates with them. That's their language. That means more to them than bringing them chocolates or buying them flowers. I know some women might be saying, don't go that far. Okay. The third love language is what? Quality time. What is quality time? Well, quality time uh, is time th that is, it's not just time that you two are, you know, maybe driving in the car or you're, you're, uh, you're, you're going about your daily duties. You, maybe uh, you're driving back from some place. You say, what do you mean I never spend any time with you? We're just three hours in the car, Right? Or your flight got delayed and, and the two of you are coming back and you say, what do you mean we didn't spend any time? We, we were in the airport for four hours. That's not quality time. Quality time is not just the time that you spend to, with one another. It's actually time that you have deliberately planned where you are going to totally focus on that person. Where there's no other distractions. You ever see people out? They're out at the restaurant. I won't ask how many people bring their phone to the table. You do that. Ooh, ooh. But it's time where you go out to dinner, you, you do something together, you, and there's no distractions. There's no phone calls. There's no text messages. There's no interruptions. There's nobody else stealing you away. It's quality time. It's where you are focused on that person and only that person. And you're looking into their face, they're looking into yours, and you're spending quality time with one another. You say, well, we sat down and we watched something together. No, that's not quality time because you're not focused on one another. Now, guys are kind of, you know, Guys don't quite need, they, they do need it a little bit, but they don't quite need this like women do because guys can just be, you know, in the same room, grunt, make some noises every once in a while, and they don't need very much conversation. Right? But uh, this is very important. When a person's love language is quality time, this is how you should show them love so that they can understand it. You give them your undivided attention. Here's some ideas. Dinner date night. Morning coffee. Evening, uh, when, uh, spending the evening together with the kids in bed. And there's no media. Face-to-face -face talking and listening. Not as, uh, not as much physical attention, but simply focus on the person. They want quality time. That's their love language. And you know what? You can do everything else on this list, but if this is their love language and you're not speaking it, they go away thinking, they don't love me. They're not showing me love. How come they're not showing me love? And you're going, what are you talking about? They need quality time. What's the fourth one? 
I lost you. Thoughtful gifts. Everyone loves gifts. It's a universal expression of love and value. But for some, without them, they even question that you love them. It's not really the amount of money that you spend on gifts. It's actually the thought that counts. Right? So, <laughs> if you're, you're rushing through the grocery store and you see those limp flowers that are marked 50% off because they're droopy, and you grab those and go, okay, my wife's love language is, is uh, gifts, and I better get her something to keep her happy. And you come home with those? You ain't speaking her language, Bubba. She's not listening to that. Uh, you need to, uh, if, if you're cheap, you need to think of this as an investment in your relationship. The gifts do not have to be expensive, but they have to be very high value. What do you mean? I thought high value is expensive. No, you can actually buy one flower and get a little baby's breath. And you can take a card and write your very own words, all 10 of them. On a card, and give her that flower and that little card, and that would be worth more to her than a truckload of roses. Absolutely. So it doesn't have to be expensive, it only has to be high value. Um, in addition to that, though, you need to understand what your wife or your husband likes, right? Because my wife doesn't, well, she likes flowers a bit. But some women like chocolate. How many people like chocolate? I personally like chocolate muffins, chocolate cake, chocolate pie. So you need to, you know, if you, th if you think you're doing her a favor <laughs> from the peanut gallery, <laughs> if you think you're doing her a favor because you bought her a new vacuum cleaner, well, I bought you a new vacuum cleaner, baby. Look, a vacuum cleaner is something you work with. It's your job. You don't buy a vacuum cleaner for a birthday gift or a Christmas gift. Unless that's not her love language. Right? Now, guys are different. If you buy him a set of sockets, I mean, he's happy. He's just looking for nuts to twist and take off and something to tear apart and put back together. But for women, it's not a, she's not looking for a piece of equipment. So you need to know what, maybe, maybe your spouse is collecting something. And so when you buy that, that's what communicates to them that you love them. They hear that as I love you. I value you. You're important to me. That's their love language. So you may be able to say it, but if they respond to that, you need to learn that love language. Okay, here's the last one. Physical affection. Physical affection is a basic human need. Children who grow up without it often feel insecure and anxious. Even animals love physical affection. You ever had a a dog, and they just love, you know, you're petting their head. They'll stand there all day. I'm not saying that people are animals, although some might be. But physical touch and physical affection is a very universal way of communicating. Now, for some, this is their love language. And for the record, I'm not just talking about sexuality and the such. I'm not just talking about that kind of physical touching, uh, although th that may be a part of it, but I'm talking about a hug. I'm talking about holding hands. I'm talking about a gentle touch. 
I'm talking about a hand on the shoulder or on the knee. I'm talking about a soft caress. I'm talking about a squeeze or a pat or a peck on the cheek or the arm around the waist. Amen. Often, men and women view touching differently. We're in an adult crowd here, aren't we? Women view touching uh, as affection, the need of affection. Men, when you touch them very much, they're going in a certain direction. I'm just saying, okay? But it's important for people to understand that affectionate touching doesn't always have to lead in that direction. Sometimes your spouse just requires, and even men who are wired that way, they, they want to feel the touch of their, their wife, the touch of her hand on the back of theirs, or the touch uh, uh, of her hand as they're driving down the road on the back of his neck as they're driving. Uh, I, I remember the story of the, 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 the guy and... Uh, the couple have been married a long time, and, and, and she turns to him and, and says, Man, I remember we used to drive in a car, and we used to sit close to one another. Remember that, how I used to sit up close to you, and, and you would drive, and, and we would go places, and we'd always, everywhere we went, we, we went like that. He said, I didn't move. But sometimes the love language is physical touch. And you could buy a thousand gifts. You could say a thousand words. But it's the touch. It is that touch of affection. Not just a sexual touching, but that touch of affection that resonates and means so much to that individual. And so it's important that you learn the love language. I want, to, I want to take just the last four to six minutes and show you this really funny video. Some of you may have seen it on Facebook. Some of you have not. It's about men's brains and women's brains. And it's really hilarious, but it's true. And so make sure our sound is up, uh, sound man, and go ahead and fire that. Let her go. Okay, so now, <laughs> we're going to start discussing men's brains, women's brains, and how they're very different from each other. Now, I want to start with men's brains, all right? Now, men's brains are, are very unique. Men's brains are made up of little boxes, and we have a box for everything. We've got a box for the car, we've got a box for the money, we've got a box for the job, We've got a box for you. We've got a box for the kids. We've got a box for your mother somewhere in the basement. We've got, we got, we, we got boxes everywhere. And, and the rule is, the boxes don't touch. <laughs> when a man discusses a particular subject, we go to that particular box, we pull that box out, we open the box, we discuss only what is in that box. All right? And, and, and then we close the box and put it away being very very careful not to touch any other boxes. Sorry, my Catholic upbringing got in there for a minute, but I... <laughs> I'm not a Catholic, but I went to Catholic school when I was little. I, I had a nun who taught on hell like she was born and raised there. I mean, I'll never forget it, but... Uh... <laughs> it did me good, actually. 
actually. It was a good thing. Now, women's brains are very, very different from men's brains. Women's brains are made up of a big ball of wire. And everything is connected to everything. The money's connected to the car, and the car's connected to your job, and your kids are connected to your mother, and everything's connected to everything. And it's like... It's like the internet superhighway. Okay? And, and it's all driven by energy that we call emotion. It's just... It's, it's, it's one of the reasons why women tend to remember everything. <laughs> because if you take an event and you connect it to an emotion, it burns in your memory and you can remember it forever. The same thing happens for men. It just doesn't happen very often because, quite frankly, we don't care. <laughs> uh, women tend to care about everything. And she just loves it. <laughs> okay. Now men, we have a box in our brain that most women are not aware of. This particular box has nothing in it. In fact, we call it the nothing box. <laughs> and of all the boxes a man has in his brain, the nothing box is our favorite box. <laughs> if a man has a chance, he'll go to his nothing box every time. <laughs> That's why a man can do something seemingly completely brain dead for hours on end. You know, like fishing. <laughs> and, and, and we love it. That's, that's why a guy can sit in front of a TV and go. This drives our wives nuts because they'll come up and say, Stop up! You can't possibly be watching anything! I'm not. measured this. The University of Pennsylvania a couple of years ago did a study and discovered that men have the ability to think about absolutely nothing and still breathe. <laughs> you know, they connected all the wires and stuff like that and watched the brain activity and then all of a sudden, <laughs> I think he's dead! Huh? You know, <laughs> women can't do it. They can't do it. Their minds never stop. And, and they don't understand the nothing box and it drives them crazy because nothing drives a woman more crazy or makes her feel more irritated than to witness a man doing nothing <laughs> Now, one of the 
biggest revelations I get out of women is this whole nothing box issue. They just, <gasps> everything's starting to make sense. <laughs> and I, I've had women say, oh, oh it's nothing. Well, well, can I go and there's nothing? <laughs> now, one of the biggest revelations I get out of women is this whole nothing box issue. They just, <gasps> everything's starting to make sense. <laughs> stress okay when a man is stressed out all he wants to do is run to his nothing box this is how we unwind the last thing we want to do when we're stressed out is talk about it we don't want to talk about it we just want to of course it just drives her nuts you know a woman will see a man in that vegetative state and she'll come up and go Nothing about nothing. In fact, I was on a roll till you showed up. <laughs> Go away! All right? Because that's how he handles stress. He just. <sighs> <sighs> now, when a woman is stressed out, she has to talk about it. If she doesn't talk about it, her brain will literally explode. <laughs> So she'll start just, I don't know, might have something to do with this. Not a girl, I you know, I never thought about this. My brother over here said, and never mind, and and, and I know men who run from their wives when they do this. They do, I say, I say well, why, why do you run from her? He says, because I don't know what to tell her. I said, dear God, man, who told you to tell her anything? She wants you to tell her anything. See, a lot of guys, they feel obligated when, when you start explaining all your stress, they feel obligated to fix you, right? Because that's what a man does. A man only tells his troubles to another man in hopes that that man will help fix it, okay? But she's not a man. And you try and fix her, she's going to kill you, all right? She doesn't want your advice. She doesn't want your help. She wants you to shut up and listen. And a couple of ladies. That's right, you tell him. Tell him to shut up. Okay, we'll just stop it there. <laughs> if we could. <laughs> Time has got away. Obviously, there's exaggeration in that on both sides. Hopefully, men are not like cavemen as described. And uh, women's brains are not going to explode. But I think there's some insight. Again, it's not the same across the board. But if that resonates true with anyone, um, maybe that little snapshot will give you a little picture. If you're offended by that little snapshot, just consider it a really bad joke. <laughs> but uh, I believe that it does give a somewhat of an insight into differences between men and women as well as this gives us some insight into our different love language. If you don't speak your partner's love language, why don't you learn it? If, 
if their love language is a certain thing, why don't you for the next month figure out a way to speak that language and see if it will make a difference in your relationship. And that goes for both partners. And, uh, and I believe that um, that will just enrich your relationship and, and, and uh, deepen your expression of love to one another. Let's stand together. Our time is gone. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm not sure where we're going with this next week, but um, this was kind of fun here tonight. Let's pray. Lord.